This is a timing curve, specifically the one out of my Red Mini. And this is the timing light I use to plot it out. So if you're interested in figuring out what your timing curve is in your car, stay tuned while I go through all the uh, steps required to do this. But let's go ahead and get started with the most basic information. I've already covered ignition timing, link up here. And I've covered timing lights, link up here. So if you haven't seen one of those two episodes, go check out one of those. But I'll do just a quick refresh uh, for those of you who are just starting on episode three. And then we'll get into uh, using the timing light on your own car. So whether you have an A-series or an A-plus motor, there are timing marks. Now, on an A-series motor, the timing marks are hidden behind this little plate. And this inset picture here shows the timing marks. The 1-4 is top dead center. The 5 and the 10 are degrees before top dead center. This little graphic here represents what the A-plus timing marks are. Um, they are attached to the timing cover itself on this little plate. So we'll be able to see both of these. I'll start off by demonstrating the A-series and then I'll go into do the A-plus uh, version as well. But if you're here to watch the A-series version, you're going to need a mirror on a stick such as this, and you'll need a small wrench, 7 16 10 mil, to access these screws to take off this little cover plate because the timing marks are hidden behind this cover plate. So one detail I forgot to talk about in the two episodes was the vacuum advance system. Before you do any ignition timing checks, you need to disconnect the vacuum advance. Otherwise it will change the readings based on how much vacuum is being applied. And if your carburetor is running manifold vacuum, you're gonna have full vacuum advance at idle. So you will have an accurate representation of what the timing is if your vacuum module is hooked up. So please disconnect the vacuum module when doing a timing check because it's important to do that. Otherwise, you'll have uh, bad information represented because of the vacuum module. So I'd like to discuss uh, terminology regarding distributor and motions. The direction of rotation is noted here on the arrow. So when the engine is running, the distributor rotor is rotating in this direction, also denoted here with this arrow. So if you decide you need to make a change to your timing, and let's say you're measuring zero degrees at idle, you want to be somewhere around 10 or so, so you need to add timing. Well, the way you add timing is rotating the distributor body in a clockwise direction. That will increase or advance the timing. Um, conversely, if you are noticing you have too much timing, let's say you have 20 degrees at idle and you want to go back down to 10, you would rotate the body of the distributor counterclockwise or anti-clockwise to retard the timing. So when I say advance or retard, now you understand this is advancing and then this would be retarding timing. So just to be clear with those two terms. Uh, secondly, I do want to demonstrate how the vacuum module advances the breaker plate. So the vacuum module is here. It's got this little spring here. Uh, it will twist the breaker plate. So as I apply vacuum, you'll notice the breaker plate is rotating in the advanced direction. And then when I release the vacuum, it rotates in a retarded direction. So that's why it's important that you need to make sure that your vacuum is disconnected because any little bit of vacuum will change the position of the breaker plate, which changes the timing on your car. So make sure you have it disconnected before we start doing any testing. By the way, on the 25D, there is a notation A and R and two arrows. If you turn this knurled knob this way in the advanced rotation, you will advance the timing. And if you rotate it in this direction, you will retard the timing. So that's what that little notation is there. That's what this knob is for. The other distributors in the mini series, the 45, the 59, the 65D, do not have this feature. This is only for early cars that have um, the 25D distributor. So now that we've gotten through those brief details, I want to talk about the timing curve bit here. So what I've done is I've listed RPM increments and 1000 RPM increments, and I've got written degrees here. So uh, these are the degrees you're going to see on the timing marks. So for instance, on the A+, 4, 8, 10, 12, 16, 20, etc. Um, that's what I'm writing down here is, is degrees on the crankshaft that I'm observing. Now, when I do the A-series demonstration, I'm only going to be checking idle timing 
and I might rev it up a little bit just to show you what it looks like when it advances. Um, most likely I'm going to be doing this one with the conventional timing light. Now I do want to warn you that the signal you're going to see captured by the camera, this one, uh, can be somewhat intermittent and it's just because of the strobing effect and the trying to synchronize a strobe flash to the camera, uh, refresh rate basically, or frame rate. So, um, Whenever I capture the information, I will just put a freeze frame here so you can see what I'm talking about. When I move on to do the timing curve, I'm going to be using my dial back system. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to shoot the screen so you can see the numbers that I see while I'm revving the engine. And that'll give us this curve. So I'm out in the garage, got the conventional timing light. I've clipped the trigger lead onto the first cylinder spark plug wire and then I've run the power and ground cables to the respective points. The power is on the battery post on the starter solenoid and the ground is on um, this little heater tap stud up here. So what I'll go do and fire it up and I will strobe against a mirror on a stick. You can't do this job without having a mirror on a stick. So um, I'll have the mirror set up down here and you guys will be able to see the timing marks using the strobe light. And since it is a, a flash and a strobe that the camera has to capture, probably what I'm gonna do is put just little fixed images of the timing as I captured on the film. So I've rotated the engine around, you can see the top dead center mark, the one slash four, very clearly there. And then if we rotate the engine a little further back, you see the five, there's the 10, there's a 15. So when it's idling, we should be able to see somewhere around the 10 degree mark. I don't know exactly what this motor's timed at, but we're going to find out here in a second. But it'll be it'll be somewhere between 10 and 15 degrees at idle here. And you can see the strobe is already happening. And from what I'm seeing, it looks like it's about 10 degrees of timing. So now that you've seen how to access the timing marks and what they look like using a conventional timing light, I'm going to go ahead and move on to using my dial back timing light and I'm gonna go ahead and strobe the set of timing marks I have on this side. This engine does have the A plus timing cover, so it has additionally the A plus timing marks. So I'm gonna go ahead and show them to you using this timing light. And I want to also demonstrate the vacuum advance and how much advance it adds um, when, you, when you apply full vacuum to the, the module here. So I've gone ahead and set up my vacuum canister to do that. So let me get set up and I'll show you guys what it looks like. So here we can see we have 9 degrees of idle timing and if I apply vacuum to the vacuum canister we can see that our timing now goes to about 22 degrees with full vacuum. So this is why you need to check your timing without vacuum applied. So now we're back to normal timing without the vacuum hooked up. So now I'm going to go ahead and do the dial back system. So first, we'll go ahead and switch the timing gun to advance, and it shows zero degrees. And we saw nine to 10 degrees down there at idle. So once I adjust this, we'll see the timing mark move from 10 degrees to zero degrees. So I'm gonna adjust the timing on the timing gun to say nine degrees. Ten degrees. So we can see here, 10 degrees on this shows zero degrees down there. And that's the beauty of the dialback system. I'm able to increase or decrease the timing delay in here so that I can see the mark down there wherever I need to see it at. So now let's go ahead and do the ignition timing curve plot. So now I'm going to go ahead and rev it from 1,000 RPMs to 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, and 5,000. And I will adjust my up or down arrows on the dial back system to position my timing mark at top dead center down there. And that will tell me what the ignition timing curve is on this distributor. So if you can't hear me, just watch this screen. And I'll point to it whenever I stabilize the reading when I see it down there.
there we go. Total timing was 35 degrees. Now let's go ahead and make a plot of that ignition timing curve. So now that I've captured the information on the timing curve using the timing light, I went ahead and came back here on the bench because I wanted to talk about this curve on the bench. So this is a plot of this timing curve, as you can see here. Now I'm going to remind everyone that I am at high altitude, so my total timing may be higher than you'd expect for sea level. Again, I'm at a mile high of elevation, so uh, 35 degrees at full throttle, or I guess full ignition timing, um, isn't too much for my engine given the lack of air that I have at this altitude. But let's go ahead and, and analyze this curve a little bit. So we've got uh, a fairly uh, clean cutoff around 4,000 RPMs at 35 degrees, and it just stays flat. So that means that uh, my full advance point is around 4,000 RPMs, and it doesn't keep advancing any further, which is great. At idle, I was seeing a very clean 10 degrees, maybe even 9 degrees, but it, it was basically 10 degrees until I started revving it past 1,000 RPMs. So that tells me that the springs in the distributor are working to hold the timing um, from advancing below 1,000 RPMs. So up to 1,000 RPMs, it, it, there's no spring advance at all. It's just fixed timing. That's why the, the information was so stable um, here at idle. Now, we see the change in slope. And again, I only tested 2,000 RPMs. I'm not sure exactly where the change in slope is, but I only collected one data point here at, at 2,000 RPMs. But we can clearly see going from 10 to 22 degrees, it's a very sharp rise on this curve, whereas from 22 to 35, it flattens out a bit. That tells me that the secondary spring is engaging and working and providing this reduction in advance timing up to 35 degrees. So it says that you know both the springs are doing something in this distributor, which is excellent because uh, the A-series does need um, some inflection in its curve. It can't handle just a straight line unless you've built an engine or something to take that timing curve. But either way, this is the curve it has, and this engine is running fairly well on this curve. And the reason I know that is because I've run this engine, I've tested it on a different distributor, and then I put this distributor in with this curve because it seemed to perform fairly well. So why do we want to capture this information? Well, we capture it so that we can monitor for changes in curves. So in this example that I talked about earlier, you could see that this was a very flat curve and it was very worn. We had a lot of initial idle timing and um, it, you know, there was also a lot of slop in this example. So the reason why we capture the timing we have now is so we can pay attention to what it looks like as time goes on and, and wear and tear develops in this system. Now, my engine, even though I have this nice distributor, you know, curve profile that I've built for it, I still could not quite tell exactly what the timing was at four and 5,000 RPMs, even with this timing light. Uh, the A-series motor I have does not have a chain tensioner, so there might be a one or two degree variation of timing I just don't know exactly what it is because the timing marks are, are fluttering um, at these higher RPMs. So 35 was my guess, but it could really be 34 or it could be 36. Uh, I, I'm just not exactly sure. So I put 35 down because that was kind of the average I was seeing. So um, be aware that even if you do monitor and record the information, it may not be as precise as you wish it was because, again, it's a fully mechanical system. If this car had a computer running the ignition system and it was running off of uh, the flywheel for its timing, then you'd have very, very crisp timing marks. But again, we have a you know, chain-driven system, so we have um, slop. But uh, that's how you would check and measure and plot out a timing curve. Hopefully you guys found this interesting and useful. I certainly enjoyed doing the process. A um, little bit of camera trouble, but hey, that's what the process is all about. So. If you guys thought it was interesting or helpful, let me know in the comments below. Otherwise, stay tuned for another episode of the Classic Mini Survival Guide. And if you made it this far in the video, thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.